Hey everybody, Steve here, and today in this video I want to talk about God and His Word and how people and uh, you know the world tries to mix the truth of God's Word with the things of the world and it ends up being watered down, sugar coated, uh, it ends up being um, kind of a real frail image of what the truth is. Now I'm not saying a lot of, a lot of people or churches do this, but as we've seen through time, as we go through and we get further and further away from the truth of God's Word, we see more of this mixing, we see more of this compromise. And a lot of people, and I call that American Christianity, um, not saying that all churches or, or people are like this, but as we've seen through time, there's more people that are adhering to a church uh, denomination or dogma, uh, their church teachings rather than the teachings of what we see in the Holy Scripture. So this creates some problems for those that are seeking God and having problems that they're, you know, it's economical, physical, spiritual hardships that they're going through. And then on top of that, the place that they're supposed to be able to get fixed, you know, like uh, Yeshua said, you know, the, the, the sick are the ones that need the doctors. Uh, you know, it's not those that are healthy, but every one of us has, has problems in our lives. Everybody has grown up, grown up dysfunctionally in some way, shape, or form, some uh, way worse than others. But the thing is, is that as a collection of believers, the ecclesia, um, that life that's in us, he's in us and we're in him, that as we have that light in our life of being new creatures in Christ, that with that we're supposed to share that light and to help each other out, um, to seek the truth. Unfortunately, a lot of people have watered that down, and they, they want a little bit of truth, but they don't want the whole truth, and they don't want it to convict the sin or the things in their life that God is, wants to deal with them in, to get them out of the slavery of sin, uh, to get them out of this continual sin, to get them out of the mindset, whatever's in their heart and their minds, of um, <laughs> heart and mind, mind and heart, to <clears throat> walk past and get out of that worldly mindset and walk into the mindset of God, of being one with Him. Uh, and when you're a new creature in Christ, there is, there's, there's a level of, there has to be a change. Uh, you're not going to continue in sin that you did before. Uh, you know, if you're a rotten apple, you're not going to be a rotten apple anymore. You know, uh, things are going to change in your life. And with that, there's going to be some observance to what God in his word says. And then there's going to be, you know, your life is going to be different. Um, but the problem is a lot of people get stuck in American Christianity where it is relevant and where it's seeker friendly and it, it, it does indeed water down the word. And with that, I get a lot of messages from people that, uh, you know, are hurting and having hard times and they send me messages. So... I just want to go over this. An uh, individual wrote and said, hey, I'm not going to use his name, but he said, uh, I'll get straight to the point. He says, I learned from school hard knocks and debating and discussions. I don't mind talking about Jesus to somebody. When it comes to Bible verses, I often find myself in a hole with the subject of Bible versions. I hit a brick wall and freeze. Um, King James Version, this is my choice version when I read, but when I get attacked with every version like NIV, ESV, and whatever others. He says, I know it's about the original Greek and Hebrew, but I was, yes, past tense in the King James only church. My question is, how can one deal with this subject? Because debating in this can break a discussion very quickly. And <clears throat> that's absolutely true. And if it gets to the point of, and it seems that, uh, you know, this King James only, and if you want to read the King James, that's fine. Uh, I read a lot of King James. I, write, I read a lot of other versions, and I go back to the he, Greek and the Hebrew. I'm not classically trained, but I go back to the definition of words, and there have been things that have changed. I also look at the Torah, uh, of the Hebrew faith, the Jewish faith, and the first five books in the Bibles, and their translation, which differs from the King James, which is more accurate. Um, and, and, and if you start getting to the point where you're discussing with somebody, and it ends up being this heated debate, been there, done that, um, my version is better. No, my version is better. All we have to do is look at Scripture. Scripture answers this. Is there a prophecy or a Scripture, the Messiah, disciples, prophets, or did they ever bring out and say, or did God say through these people, these men of God or women of God, say there's, there's going to be a time where there's going to be one version that will arrive and that will be the only version to use? 
Um, no, there's not. Um, it's a, the King James Version is a good version, and other versions are good versions. But just as the arguments for the King James only people, I can, sh you know, that there's words change and there's stuff missing. And they, well, I can show that exact same stuff in the King James Version. And usually, from what I've found in my personal experience, is it gets to that point of arguing and butting heads. It's no longer about the truth. It is about a cause. It's about being a partisan uh, type of mentality of saying, you know, well, my cause is better than your cause. Uh, it's like... Really? Um, we're supposed to be preaching the gospel. We're supposed to be the truth of our lives. Uh, it's supposed to be the light of the world, just as he is the light of the world. And that if we're in him and he's in us, we're going to be preaching the truth. And the truth is that we're all going to paraphrase, okay? Everybody's going to die, and they're going to stand before God in judgment. You know, it's a point of being once to die and then face judgment. Uh, so we're all going to paraphrase to get our point across, and the point is that we've all sinned. And that uh, there needs to be a penalty and a punishment for sin, for breaking God's law, that sin of missing the mark, the perfection of God in his word and his instructions for life. And that when we break his law, just as like we break a, a speeding limit or something, um, there's going to be a penalty. There's a ticket. It's on the books that, that we have broken his law. And there's a fine and a penalty. And if we can't, then there's punishment. Uh, but... You know, the Messiah, he, the Savior, our Savior, Yeshua, he took that fine and that punishment. He paid the sacrifice. He paid the price with his life, even though we don't deserve it by any means. So with that, <clears throat> I can start seeing if we start arguing about a King James only thing and it gets to the point where it's just about, well, mine's better than yours. Mm, you know what? If you really want to get down to it, go back to the Hebrew and Greek, and we'll find that both versions are are, are missing some things, okay? So, uh, you know, and even if you go back to the Torah in the Hebrew faith, in, in the, the first five books of the Bible, you'll find out a more accurate translation than what's in the King James. But the thing is, the life that we talk about with others, that's what's important. And the question that this individual will end up asking, you know, well, how do you... You know, how do you deal with this? You know, my question is, how can one deal with this subject? If it comes to translations, don't deal with it. Use their translation and still bring forth, hey, it is a point of man wants to die and face judgment. Uh, the truth of God and his word can be found in all these different translations. Now, there's some translations that I, you know, wouldn't trust farther than I could spit. But for the most part, you can still... Take the truth that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever should believe it in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, and bring out that, you know, Jesus, he came and Yeshua said, you know, repent or perish. Uh, that was the message that he preached. And he said that on that day, he said, many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy and cast out demons and do all these things? Um, and he'll say, he'll, he, he'll say, you know, depart from me. I never knew you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I never knew you. It's a it's a relationship thing. Okay. It's not uh, a, a format, a doctrine, a list of rules of things to do to cast out demons. Uh, demons might leave, but you know what? It might be the demons dispensing with people, saying, you know, hey, Joe Demon says, hey, get out of here and let this guy pretend that he's a he's a real godly person, and uh, we'll be good to go. And in fact, that's the focus instead of having that relationship with God. Uh, that's a great enemy tactic is to pretend that uh, things that God is doing things when really it's it's uh, the enemy um, <clears throat> but with this when you get to the point use their scriptures talk about the truth uh, and there's a lot of things that you know if people ask you know well you use this translation usually that's called deflection they're deflecting the point of, of what's going on that there's something in their life that that they don't want to address in their lives um, some people just debate to debate, and usually those people don't want to listen. So, you know, cast your pearls before swine, and, you know, what do you get? I don't know. Uh, scripture says don't do that. Uh, the other thing that this individual says is that uh, I don't trust churches much because most of them are sugar-coated and watered down around here. <clears throat> Same here. Uh, been to the church. Uh, God says he loves you and never punishes you that you have sinned. Uh, all the way to the hellfire preaching of repent or you go to hell and live in holiness. Uh, you know, 
and it ends up that this individual says, I'm very hurt and lost, and I don't know who to turn to. I was a dedicated church member before I, uh, some bad things happened, and that's why I'm lost. Uh, I know too much to be lost. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, this person is, person is looking for, for counsel and spiritual guidance and things like that. And uh, Here's my two cents. Get into God's Word. Find some like-minded individuals who search after God's Word. And, it, and when you get to that point, because American Christianity, that watered-down Christianity, really is watered-down and, and blech, you know, relevant and seeker-friendly, and it doesn't preach the, the, the whole counsel of God on many, so many different levels. We got kicked out of a church because, you know, they wanted to evangelize the, the city we were in, and, and, but yet they, wanted, they just wanted to fill the seats in the church. They wanted to pay the bills and the leases and, and all the, the debt that they had and to be a mega church. But they didn't want to preach the truth. They didn't want to preach that, you know, everyone has sinned, all has fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, they didn't preach 1 John 1 9. They didn't preach that, you know, there is there is a different type of walk with believers than the rest of the world. You know, it was interesting because this one pastor was like, you know, well, that's not our job is to tell people that they've sinned. That's not the mission. That's not the vision, uh, the mission statement of the church. And it's like, wow. So you have people in the church that didn't know there was a hell, that didn't know that as they're going out and getting drunk and sleeping around and adultery and divorce and, and you know, all these things and, and you know, beating their kids and, and, and drugs and, and having all these problems. And these people are wondering why they're not blessed. Well, it's because God says, don't, don't continue in sin. Don't live the way the world does. Uh, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament show that that's not to be it. You know, cast out their moral brother. Uh, those who continue in sin, those that continue in sin, are, aren't going to find their, their, their themselves in, in heaven. Uh, but there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So those who continue in sin and feed the flesh, <clears throat> it, it's trampling on the grace of God for an occasion of the flesh, as Paul said. So, you know, and when we said, hey, well, you know, that's a false convert, and uh, that's going to send people to hell, uh, I got really bad, and we got kicked out. So it was as bad as that was. Uh, you know, it was a really great thing. It was a liberating thing because now we could get to God in His Word and study on our own. Um, <clears throat> you know, to get more background, you know, what do you do? You got to find like-minded individuals who search after the truth. It's interesting because this is going to be a controversial statement because the church that we go to now is messianic. Now, people are going to say, oh, Messianic faith, there's a lot of cults in Messianic faith, there's a lot of false teaching. Well, there's a lot of, a lot of false teaching in, the, in American Christianity as well. I mean, in the Protestant denominations, I think they got the corner on the quantity of false teaching. Uh, you know, not that quantity has anything to do with it, but false teaching came up way, way before in the Protestant church, um, and it's crept into the Messianic faith as well. Uh, the belief system of the Messianic Church goes back and shows that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so you have the Ten Commandments. Uh, we see in, uh, I think it's Deuteronomy, that talks about how the Jews and the foreigners who followed after God, the Gurs, the Deeks, the god fearers, who came out of Egypt at the same time, the same law, the same Torah, which is better translated as instructions for life. God gave those instructions for life. If you do these things, you'll be blessed. If you don't commit adultery, guess what? You won't reap that sin of adultery. It won't attack you and your family and have all these repercussions of sin, uh, you know, and child support and the whole nine yards. Um, but rather, if we're obedient to God and his word and we don't engage in adultery or whatever sin that is listed there by omission or commission, then we will be blessed because we won't be enslaved by that. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of what we see in American Christianity is that, well, I only have to follow the, the Ten Commandments, and then there's a lot of people who don't follow the Ten Commandments. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, I only have to, to follow what, what Jesus said, you know, that don't hate your brother. Uh, you know, it's like murder. You've heard it said, don't commit murder, but uh, I say, you know, don't hate your brother in your heart. Well, actually, that goes back to Leviticus 19. He was actually quoting the Old Testament. And remember, he said, you know, I haven't come to abolish the law of the prophets, uh, you know, but to fulfill or to establish is a, is a more correct translation. Uh, you'll see that Paul says, you know, that the law is good. The instructions of God, uh, his Torah instructions for life, are good. 
uh, trustworthy, true, depending on what translation, if used lawfully. It's just like if you obey the speed limits uh, here on earth, you won't get a ticket, you won't get a fine, and you'll, that'll help ensure the safety, you'll know the boundaries in which you can operate and not harm yourself or others. It's the same thing with God's Word and His commandments. Um, you know, people say, you know, and with this Messianic Church thing, people say, well, how can, it's impossible to follow 613 laws. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, the word law is kind of a, a wrong statement because we view that as being under the law. Uh, you know, the, the law has been done away with, the law of sin and death. Well, as I break God's law, I walk into sin, and what is sin? The, the, the fruit of sin is death. It will eventually grow, and it will produce death. So when we walk in that law of sin and death, uh, see, the law is two-sided. If I walk and I break the law, then I'm in sin and death, okay? And that separates me further and further from God. It causes problems in my family, spiritually, physically, emotionally, and everything else. But if I am observant to the law and I don't break that law and I'm over here, guess what? Then I have that hedge of protection of being obedient and observant to God's law, and I'm not enslaved in that sin as I was over here. There's not that repercussion, that cause and effect relationship of, I commit adultery, wow, now you got a bastard child, now you got child support, now you got, uh, you know, you broke that covenant, that marriage vow that you made with your, your wife, and, and uh, you know, so many other things. But if I'm obedient and observant to what God has said to do, he said it would be well with us. So as we're observant to God's word, because it is in our heart, and Jeremiah says that, you know, God impressed upon him and said, you know, that I will write my law, my Torah, my instructions for life in your minds and your hearts, and I will forgive your sins and remember your iniquities no more. Paraphrased. So as New, Custom, uh, New Testament or New Covenant believers, that old covenant that was written on the tablets uh, of stone is now going to be written on the flesh or the tablets of our heart. So it is a living, breathing, it's that relationship. Uh, and, and Jesus, Yeshua, said that he's going to be in us and we're going to be in him. We're a new creature in Christ because his laws are going to be written on our hearts and our minds. Um, but people today in American Christianity, they don't want to do that. They don't want to acknowledge and say, um, well, those Old Testament laws, are, those are just for the Jews. If you actually read, you'll find out that God's laws, his instructions are the same for the Jews as for the Gentile believers, the God-fearers that followed them and came out of Egypt together. Never was there a separation between the two. Wow, you won't hear that preached a lot in church on Sunday. Um, but with that... Uh, you know, some people might say, you know, well, wait a second. You know, well, well, you've got a beard. You know, you've cut your beard. The corners of your beard. And that's in Leviticus and the, the Jews. You're not supposed to cut your beard uh, because that's a, so you've broken the commandments. So see, you, you, you don't even live up to the standards of the Old Testament. Uh, the problem is you need to look at what that actually means. And if you go back to the definitions of the words and look those things up instead of taking the definitions that we see that are kind of watered down in the translations we have today, even the King James says don't cut or trim the corners of your beard. If you go back to original Hebrew, you'll find out that, that don't rip or tear your beard or rip or tear your hair because back in those days, the pagans who followed after false gods when somebody would die, that what would happen is that they would take that beard and then they'd rip the hair out of their flesh. And that was actually a sign of following after a false god because God never he never tells us to har do anything to harm us show me where it says that we're supposed to do those things so what God was doing was showing those people back then the the Jews and the, the Gentile believers that followed after God was don't do these things don't practice the things of the world and rip your hair out because somebody died because God's going to take care of them so when you read things like this, and if you don't research and study of, of what those things actually mean, it doesn't mean that I can't shave and have a nice looking little thing that I got here. Um, it doesn't mean that at all. It doesn't mean that I broke the commandment. What it's talking about is in times of mourning, don't rip out my hair, cause damage to the flesh of my body. Because our comfort is knowing that he is going to take care of those who have passed on. 
Scripture says, you know, in in a passage, and I forget, forget exactly the reference, but it says basically, you know, people question why a righteous man is taken. And he's taken because to be spared of further suffering. So, you know, for those people to say, you know, well, you can't observe all the 613 laws. Well, I can't. Because some of them don't even apply to me. There are some that apply just to women. There are some that just apply to, to the temple. Uh, there are some apply to specific groups of people like Levites and things like that. I'm not a Levite. And there's a lot of Jews that aren't Levites. So, but it's interesting that when we look at the things that God tells us to do, even as Gentile believers, when we go back to the Old Testament, we see that those things haven't passed away. They have not been done away with. You know, those 613 laws talks about, you know, how you how if you hire somebody to work for you for a set amount, you're supposed to pay them that, that amount of which you agreed upon. If you don't and you cheat them, in other words, you lied and you're being greedy because you're holding back that money, guess what? There's bad fruit in your heart and there's evidence of that. So the 613 laws includes and talks about how to deal with employees or how to deal with all kinds of things. But yet, none of those things have been done away with. And the thing is, is that if God has said his, his law, even as Paul said, his word is holy and true and righteous and just, uh, depending on the translation, how can what God made as holy, what was once holy, how is that now profane? Uh, remember, he, you know, Messiah said, you know, I haven't come to do away with the law and the prophets, but to fulfill and rather the fulfill, when you go back to the definition, means to establish. Paul says that we are supposed to establish the word, uh, the laws, the Torah, the instructions for life in our lives, um, so that we don't continue in sin, so that we're at liberty, we're, we are free from sin, and the trappings and the enslaving and the reaping and the sowing of sin, which leads to death. Uh, there is no steal, kill, and destroy, um, but rather there is that hedge of protection that God has us in within his camp within his walls of, of being observant and obedient to him and it's not a list of obedience where we say you know well i got to do this crap i got to do this and this and just just so i can be saved no we're saved by grace uh and i was prophesied from the beginning that there would be a messiah and it's through god's mercy and grace and love that we are saved it is nothing it is by no works of our own that we are saved so I have found a lot of answers within the Messianic faith. I've also found a lot of false teachers within the Messianic faith as well. So, again, going back to Scripture, test everything. Uh, nobody, has, uh, nobody has all the truth, okay? We need to test everything because we, we're having problems. So, with this, um, be careful in what you do, where you go, and where you hang your hat. Um, you know, kind of keep people's at arm's length and, and test everything and still be able to give that love and that light to share that and to walk in observance to God in his word. But if you get to the point of where people say, you know, well, the law has been done away with and, and you got this guy who's, you know, all of a sudden the pastor's a drunkard and he's a drug addict and he's been cheating on his wife. And yet there he preaches a message of, you know, well, you know, God's word's been done away with. We just have to, to believe. Uh, guess what? Because you got rid of those boundaries that God had set forth and said, within these boundaries, you will be blessed. And if you step outside of these boundaries, you're going to get cursed. That, that's what happens. If you start walking in this, this laissez-faire, you know, Christianity, I'm okay, you're okay, and I can do anything I want as long as I just ask forgiveness, uh, you're going to find yourself more on the outside of the, that hedge of protection than you are on the inside where God wants us to be that set-apart people. Um, but with that said, it's, uh, you know, what do you do? Uh, people are hurting and they're looking for truth. They're looking for peace and comfort. And that's where you got to go to him. Uh, it's not about any movement. It's not about any church. Uh, you know, that's, you know, people ask me where I go to church and I'm kind of hesitant because, you know, there is that stigma of whatever denomination that you or church that you go to. Oh, okay. You know, or, oh, okay, that's cool. Uh, you know, but really... Is it people really wanting to get to the heart of the matter, or is it just kind of small talk and banter? That's what, what we need to look at. But as far as peace and comfort and things like that, we need to look at God and his word. We need to look at, because a lot of people are hurting. And this is where the warning that I have with this is that if you get to a place 
where you are hurting and you're alone and you've been rejected and you've been kicked out of the church or whatever hard times that you've fallen on physically, spiritually, emotionally, the whole gamut, uh, there's a lot of false teachers and cults out there that will latch on to this and say, well, we've got the truth. And then it ends up, you know, if you look into my other videos in Fellowship of the Martyrs, FOTM, uh, we get involved in that cult because of that exact same thing. We're looking for a cause and a movement instead of instead of looking for God and his word. Um, thankfully, God rescued us from that false teaching, from that cult, and uh, to where, it, you know, just so many bad things, so many bad things happened there. So many lives and marriages were destroyed and, you know, adulteries and multiple divorces and bigamy. And, and you don't find that out. And that's what's interesting. People say, well, how could you fall for that? Well, because that's not what they preached in the beginning. They preach that, you know, don't you want to have that peace and comfort? Don't you want to find the real truth? Don't you want to find the truth, uh, the real church of God, you know, where people love each other and unconditionally? Well, of course, if you're hurting and, you know, all this, the bad crap that you've been through, yeah, of course we want that. Well, that's the draw of cults. And if you don't test everything, you can find yourselves and ask those hard questions that's how a lot of people find themselves in cults or in false teaching is because uh, they get that love and that's what draws them into that cult and, and, and we don't test everything. So uh, you need to be careful of that as well. Um, so I know this is kind of a long video. I, I went over some of this stuff uh, about this individual and, and uh, but, you know, a lot of cults will, will latch on to debating against, you know, Bible translations, and they'll, there's a lot, a lot of truth in uh, cults, dangerous uh, religious cults, DRGs or DRCs, uh, dangerous religious cults, because they use so much truth. But it's just like it's just like rat poison. Um, you know, rat poison is like 99.9% uh, healthy food, and but it's that little bit, that little bit of poison in there that kills. And unfortunately, what we see with the enemy, with Satan, uh, Lucifer, Hostung, whatever you want to call him, uh, the enemy, he uses a lot of truth, but he'll just twist and manipulate a little here, a little there, a little there, to get you outside of those boundaries, outside of that hedge of protection, by actually breaking God in his word and going against his commandments and, and his statutes, his principles, his precepts. And um, we need to be mindful of that. So... I don't know if this really answered the question for this individual. I hope it does. Um, it, you know, when you're looking for a church, it's really hard. Where we were at, we couldn't find one that uh, was not watered down. You know, it was just all, and everybody, or, or it was just the place where it was so morning basic and, and so milk church, milk toast church, that there would, you know, you, God loves you and we love you and, you know, we're supposed to do what's right and, and uh, here's what we do as a church and then it stops there. There is no growth. There is no maturity uh, of anybody there, you know, so we couldn't do that either. And the, the mixing and the compromising of, you know, being seeker friendly and, and friendly with the world and how the world does things and, and uh, you know, trying to reach out in a corporate way instead of the way that God wants us to reach out is, is with our hearts and to speak life into people. Uh, that's something to, to think about. But uh, where we're at now, it's not a perfect church. Um, you know, like I said, I don't think there is a perfect church anywhere. But what you need to do is to seek God, stay in his word, regardless of where you're at, even if you're not in a church. And for a number of years, we weren't. And the things that God showed us in his word that were ignored or viewed as being too controversial are actually things that... Uh, uh, we saw before we even got involved in the messianic faith, um, which again I don't even I don't even like that term because it you know just go to God and His Word. God says that the Sabbath is a is a perpetual covenant that lasts forever, and we see that in the Sabbath in the new heaven and the new earth, and we see His festivals there as well. And He says you know this will be a perpetual, everlasting, forever covenant. Do this always for for your generations, and, and you know while you follow God, whatever translation you use. Uh, there's things that we're supposed to be doing that sets us apart from the world. Um, it's interesting because people want to be evangelists. They want to be teachers. They want to be end times prophets and, you know, the leader of the 144,000 or one of the two witnesses. or You know, they want to do all these great and glorious things for God. They want to be like Moses or the prophet Elijah. Uh, they want to have that mantle of Ezekiel or, you know, whatever the heck that is. But really when it comes down to it, we're just supposed to be observant. 
We're supposed to follow God. We're supposed to love God. We're supposed to be a new creature in Christ. We're supposed to be like that widow that, that gave that two pence, that, those two mites, and gave all she had. That's if God lays on your heart to give all you have, then do that. But we're supposed to give without compulsion. We're supposed to give as he puts on our heart. So it's not supposed to be a formula. Well, if I give this, I'm, I'm going to tithe, so I'm going to be blessed. And that's the whole purpose for tithing. And guess what? Um, that's, the enemy might use that. It might work. But your relationship with God is going to be very stale and stagnant if that's all you're doing that for. It's, well, I'm going to get blessed, so I'm going to tithe. The thing is, is in the Old Testament, it talks about families and tithing. I know I'm digressing, but families and tithing, it said, you know, you have nine cows, all of the first nine cows are yours. And then the tenth cow that passed under the, the rod of the Lord, that belonged to God. So in other words, what we see is, and this is one church read through, it just, you know, everybody had to tithe. Ten percent gross off the top, that's what you had to do. And it was like, to be a member of the church, you had to tithe. It's like, uh, Jesus didn't tithe. Oh, Lord, talk about opening up a can of worms. It's like he was a carpenter. Uh, the tithe at that time where he lived, and even in the Old Testament, carpenters didn't tithe. It was only farmers and herdsmen. <coughs> and, and, and you could have heard a pin drop. But <clears throat> the thing is, is that we're not, God will never set up something within your life or tell you to do something that will take away from your ability to provide for your family. And that's what we see in the Old Testament. The first nine cows belong to you. So you, so God says, hey, these first nine cows or nine animals or whatever they are, are for you to provide for you and your family so they can be fed. Uh, you could save up the food so you can make it through hard times, whatever the case is. But the tenth one, the excess that belongs to the Lord. So God is always going to provide for you and your family. And as you work that way, but the problem is I've been to churches and seen churches and everybody's heard about them where the church will institute a tithe, 10% gross right off the top and ends up people can't uh, keep their lights on. They can't keep the heat on. They can't feed their families. And, and uh, you know, there's times where God has intervened and, and brought prosperity or, or blessing to those people. But it's not because the, because of the 10% tithes. Abraham did that once, and it was it was the thing that, it, it wasn't a commandment of God. But rather what we see in the New Testament, we're supposed to give as we see need, which is a huge difference. And so it's interesting how in American Christianity, they'll latch onto the Old Testament, well, you need to tithe 10% and give to our corporate church. And But then in the New Testament, you say, well, it says give, you know, don't give under compulsion. Give what is on your heart. Your giving should be done in secret. And so, you know, the, the, the one church, it was really interesting, one church we got kicked out of, he said, well, you, you know, one of the reasons for us getting kicked out is we didn't support the church. Um, and it's like, well, I don't understand. What do you mean we don't support the church? You know, I'm kind of scratching my head. I was doing Bible studies, uh, helping out with youth group. Uh, I was there uh, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. And, uh, you know, Bible studies, discipleship classes, evangelism, and all this stuff. And yet they're saying you don't support the church. And, it, and uh, here, here's, the, here's the thing. Well, you don't support the church. Okay, well, how? Because if I'm walking in sin, I need to know exactly what am I doing wrong. Because I need to repent or perish. It's that simple. I need to get my family in order into what we're doing and walk in the truth of God and his word to be observant and not be disobedient. Well, it ends up, they said, well, you know, we need people to support the church. And, and, you know, we've been looking over the finances. And it was like, what? So you, I, I stopped him right there. I said, this pastor, I said, so so you're looking at the books to see what we gave. I said, I can tell you automatically what you'll see. You'll find zero. Because we don't write checks. Uh, we don't put money in envelopes and put our names on it and put the amounts. We just, if there's an envelope uh, and you know, we put the money in there, we just put a big smiley face on the front. Or we just put cash and, and put that in the plate. And, and that's it. We never, we never write checks. We never do any of that. Because God's word says that your giving should be done in secret. And so it's like, so you're telling me that you're going through the books and for people that pay in cash, uh, so suddenly we don't support the church? I said, you know, I told him at times, there's times that we have put more than 10% in. Way more. 
I said, now tell me as a leader, as a, as a, as a, a pastor, a leader of a church, is what you're doing scriptural? Because now you're making an assumption. Instead of coming and asking me, which really is secret, giving is supposed to be done in secret, that has nothing to do with church. And so anyway, it went downhill from there, and it, and it just got really ugly. But, uh, you know, people will start saying all kinds of things when you start walking the truth, and especially if you're, you're in a seeker-friendly, you know, you're okay, I'm okay, God's best life now type of church, and you start speaking the truth of God and his word, and you start, more importantly, living that truth and asking questions and testing everything, people are going to get angry because it's going to confront the sin and it's going to confront their dis disobedience to Scripture. And uh, that can be a lonely, hard walk. So, But uh, the thing is, is that pray for God and his wisdom. Pray for his peace, his strength, to open up the truth of his word to you and to, to bring into that fellowship, that discipleship. Um, but ultimately, seek him first, and everything else will be added unto you. Uh, you know, and it's not going to be the, the Bentley and the, the mansion and things like that. It might not mean that. It might mean that you, like in a third world country, you still might be starving, but the peace is knowing that, is that God is there and that he has a mansion for you, and it's, it's in the new heaven and the new earth. It's not now. Your best life is not now. Not like Paul, Paul Olst, uh, Joel Olstein says, your best life is not now. There is no way it's now. Our job is to work and to do what we need to do to draw others to Christ. Um, so anyway, this has been a, an entirely long video, longer, and it, it went places I, I wasn't intending to go. But with that, um, that's something to think about. There's the... The, the individual that, that sent me the message, like other people, you know, I, I'm lonely, I'm lost, I don't know where to go. Um, you know, I wish I could fix everything, but I can't. Only he can. Uh, but we need to get our priorities straight and seek after him and God. Um, there's no perfect church. There's no one has a corner on the truth. Um, but that's why scripture says to test everything. But, uh, you know, look for those things. Look, for, look, test, search, seek, pray, ask. Uh, and walk and be observant to God and his word because that doesn't matter what anybody else does. And the thing is that we found is that during these desert times, during these times we're out in the wilderness by ourselves, you can either do one of two things. Either you're going to go back to the world and dive into that same sin and, and be in a worse position, or you're going to get a point to where you're going to have to get into God and his word and to trust and rely on him, and that will develop that strong relationship. Um, and then, you know, God's going to work on you in your life. So anyway, that's it. Um, just some interesting stuff. And, and uh, I know there's probably going to be some, some people out there, some haters, and just say, oh, he's messing around. He, went, he fell off the map. He's off the reservation. Um, you know what? If that's what you want to believe, that's fine. But the things that I've seen is that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we see those things. And just the simple, the simple truths that we found out, uh, even before we went to this messianic church or messianic faith thing, is that we saw the truth of God and his word. When God says things last forever, he means forever. Uh, if there's things that God says that, that we're supposed to do, then we probably should be doing them. If there's things that we're not supposed to be doing, kind of like putting your finger in a light socket, then yeah, if you do those things, you're going you're gonna to reap what you sow. Uh, and God is, it's amazingly simple if we just approach God in his word like a child. Well, God says that we do these things forever. A child would tell you, well, forever means forever. It means eternity. If you, and even if you get into the definition of the Hebrew and the Greek, you'll find, yep, yeah, eternity forever without end, perpetual. Uh, why can't we take God at his word? And how, who are we to think that we can engage in the sins of the world and the flesh and the trappings of this world and still try to be a Christian at the same time. And then we wonder why we're not being blessed in our lives. It's because of the sin. Um, anyway, uh, I think that's going to be it for now. Coffee's getting a little cool and I need to nuke it up again. So anyway, uh, I hope that helps. Don't, don't deal with the translations or the versions deal with the truth uh, and, and speak that truth. Preach the gospel, the good news. 
And then when you start getting down into discipleship, it's more one-on-one. -on -one. I think the church is really, the American Christianity is lacking in discipleship, in discipleship in God and his word. There's a lot of discipleship going on, but it's not, it has nothing to do with God and his word, and it deals more with corporate and, and denominational teachings and, and what God has put forth. So, but that's not the case everywhere. So anyway, that's it. Uh, take care, God bless, and uh, Lord willing, we'll see you on the next video. Peace.